Good evening, everybody. I'm David Schubert, the editor of the Post-Gazette, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here to this remarkable uh, forum and this session here. We're going to examine all sorts of questions about transportation. I'll start by saying that this morning I got up and drove a rental car to an airport, took a, an airplane flight here, took my own car to the, uh, oh, I forgot, I took a, um, took a shuttle bus to the airport and drove my own car to the office. And among the common things we're going to discuss today is how I would have traveled in the year 2025 and whether any of those things would have been relevant to my day to day. But before we do so, I want to introduce Morgan O'Brien, who is the head of Peoples, who is, which is the sponsor of this terrific uh, uh, series on energy. And I want to ask him to give the welcoming remarks. There he is right there. I want to thank David and the Post-Gazette team. I mean, they've done a great job really pulling together each of these different discussions. So hopefully you, you're going to be able to participate and follow along as, as we move forward. Um, a lot of folks have said, you know, why is a gas utility, you know, supporting a discussion around transportation? And, uh, you know, for us, one, it's this is the discussion you're going to hear and the, the talking about what's going to happen in 2025. A lot of that's going on right here in Pittsburgh, which is really exciting for us. Um, the other side of that coin, and you're going to hear about all the different types of transportation and how we're, we're rethinking things we used to do and, you know, think of how important oil and the wars we fought in the Middle East trying to protect that oil because it was so important to our transportation. Today you're going to hear a lot about transportation that doesn't have anything to do with oil. Um, it's about energy and innovation and all of that focused around what's happening here in this region. So we're a Pittsburgh-based company and we're excited to be here and excited about the future. And so much of the future is literally going on here. As a utility company today, we're, we're helping our, our customers uh, think differently about energy. We have universities who are looking to come off the electric grid and create their own little microgrids to become more sustainable and lessen their carbon footprint. Um, we're working with innovations on how to make transportation, you'll hear today, cleaner. Uh, substantially cleaner, things that we hadn't really thought about, even boats going up and down the river. And as you know, in Pittsburgh, we have lots of boats that go up and down the river. Um, we have cars that are going to be running by electricity, but where that electricity is produced and how that electricity gets produced is going to change dramatically in the years ahead. And so we're, we're excited to be part of this discussion, but really part of what's going on in this region. And we see our mission really to help folks like you're going to hear today to accomplish the things they're looking to accomplish. So thank you for being here. It's a great turnout. And thanks, David, and the Post-Gazette for all their hard work pulling this together. Thank you. Well, thank you, Morgan. Uh, two things strike me as remarkable. One is that we could have a session on transportation and fill this room on a day in which we had uh, torrential rains of a biblical character. And the second is that we could have a conversation about transportation and we will not be talking about oil. Those of you old enough to remember the 1973 oil scare, remember the long lines, the obsession with, uh, with the prices, conversations about OPEC, all of that sort of thing, um, that's gone. The United States is almost or may well be energy uh, independent, and we're looking at driverless cars and sources of energy that were unimaginable in 1973 when we thought the entire world revolved around oil prices. So I'm going to introduce this panel, and then we're going to have a lively conversation. As you know, uh, many of you picked up all those, those little cards and those little golf club um, uh, pencils. And um, uh, if you have questions, please, uh, Please write them down and send them to the middle of the aisle and uh, somebody will pick them up and we'll be try to get to as many as we can. Uh, I'm going to start over here with Peter Rander, who's the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of Argo AI, and he will explain to us in a few minutes what that is. Right here beside me is Costa Samaras, who's an uh, engineering professor at CMU. He directs the Center for Engineering and Resilience for Climate Adaptation, and he'll explain to us what those words mean, because I don't have the slightest idea. <laughs> Beside me is 
Lisa Ekela, Senior Policy Analyst and Transportation Planner with RAND, focusing on the intersection of transportation and climate policy. Richard Price, Executive Director of the Pittsburgh Regional Clean Cities. He's known for his work with alternative fuel vehicles. Many of you saw those down, downstairs on your way up, which is why we had to start two or three minutes later because we couldn't get you out of those places, those cars. And finally, uh, Miguel Guerrero, who's an engineer and former NASA scientist, and he's the CEO and founder of Blue Glass Marine. So let me start by asking each of you, and we'll start with you, Miguel, with um, tell us the most exciting, most unusual, most, most, stereotype breaking thing you're thinking about or working on right now in terms of transportation? Well, um, we, we focus a lot in, in the marine sector um, and that's uh, it's our bread and butter market. Um, we uh, are making our way towards uh, cleaning up emissions uh, for really large ships. But you have to start small and and uh, learn to walk before you run. Um, I just want to drop a fantastic statistic. Um, just 15 of the largest ships on Earth, the ones that carry the 10,000 containers each, create as much pollution as all cars combined on Earth. Just 15 of those. There are 100,000 of them. Um, and. Uh, we know that we can cut that pollution by more than 95%. So we're making some significant progress towards that by going with the smaller ones and making our way towards the larger ones. So that's, that's what occupies my mind every day. Okay. Richard. Well, I, I think uh, just energy diversity in general. Um, as you see all the different vehicles that we had out there, you're seeing light duty, but you haven't seen the, the big interest in the heavy duty vehicles um, that you see many of the major companies across the United States doing. So, um, you know, uh, I, I believe uh, I, one of the presentations that, uh, that I've seen in the past that one of the brand new natural gas class A tractors uh, running on complete natural gas can take off I believe something like over a hundred of the diesel uh, older diesel tractors off the road so just that uh, in general can show how much we can clean the environment uh, in doing that. Lisa? So I know I'm here for the Energy Forum, but probably the most exciting thing I'm doing is work with the National Safety Council on a project they're calling Road to Zero. The idea is to eliminate car uh, deaths from car crashes and serious injuries from car crashes within the next 30 years. And they think it's feasible based on a combination of what's called the safe system approach, so making our infrastructure and our vehicles safer, um, as well as some of the emerging safety technologies, including autonomous vehicles. So a lot of the energy that we use on the road also comes from congestion. Some of that congestion is from crashes. And as Lisa was saying, uh, crashes are a big deal in the United States. Over 40,000 people die a year on the roads. That's more than guns. And so the exciting thing about uh, driverless technology, many of you, many of you took uh, a ride in the driverless Uber downstairs. That might be a little bit away before we can buy one of those, but you can go out tomorrow and buy a car that helps you stop when there's a car in front of you or keep you in your lane or, or tell you if there's something in your blind spot. That's a robot. That's a computer doing that, right? But it doesn't seem like it. And just those three things, the stuff you can buy already, could reduce uh, about a third of all traffic deaths on the road. So we don't have to wait for the, you know, the robots to drive. We can, help, we can let them help us drive and we'll do a lot better. And for me, the, the self-driving technology part, something I've been working on for a very long time, and anybody who's been in Pittsburgh for long enough knows the Robotics Institute has tons of all different kind of robots running around. The part that, that I think most people aren't thinking about so much, which are points that uh, two of my colleagues here have just made, which is so many people die every year in something that we just take for granted. I grew up in a place where you're 16 years old and your dream is on your 16th birthday. If you can go in and get your driver's license and start driving the car, uh, 
and it's just like it's a right, and it's a it's a, something that's given, um, and you're not really thinking about the the kind of societal risk that's going on there, that safety impact, because you're you know we're all we're all good drivers, right? We all think we're good drivers. Almost everyone thinks they're an above average driver, but the reality is we all get distracted. Uh, we have these little wonderful devices uh, that, of course, uh, smartphones that are really incredibly distracting and incredibly powerful. We also have a generation of people now who are coming of age uh, uh, who have grown up with these things as d distractions to sit in the back seat, to be engaged, to be Snapchatting, to be uh, instant messaging, whatever it might be, who are now becoming drivers themselves. And that 40,000 person uh, uh, fatality rate in the US is up dramatically just in the last couple of years. It's, uh, so the idea that we're disrupting uh, a trend and really giving an opportunity to dramatically improve the safety and the efficiency of, of the, the road networks. Most cars are sitting idle most of the time too. So really a neat idea to have self-driving, have a, the car can go and do other things while you're, uh, uh, while, while you're busy at work or at play or asleep. So. so I'm going to go around the table one more time and ask this question each of you want to give a stab at. How will we be driving or how will we be getting from place to place in the year, say, 2027, 10 years from now? How will we get to the Steelers game? How will we get to the, see the Steelers in the Super Bowl? Because inevitably, <laughs> we'll be doing that. How will kids get to school? How will I get to work? How will you get to this event? It, at the uh, Super Bowl, where there will probably be 65 or 75,000 people, will there be 75,000 Ubers at the end of the game to take people back to their hotels? How are we going to transport ourselves in that year? So uh, I just learned uh, this week that Uber now is also available on boats in, um, in, in Europe, um, which uh, you, know, you, you don't think about it, uh, but because you have 400 bridges here. Uh, but but if, you need to, if you need to cross the river, then you need that. Um, I uh, think that uh, it's going, going to be a combination of what exists today, but a smarter today. Um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, not reinventing the wheel, uh, the wheel because that uh, that just takes decades and decades but enhancing the wheel if, if you will um, with smarter technologies that pollute less um, and um, uh, we obviously have a, a lot of great technologies that never see the light of day because regulation is in the way or or because they are they are too expensive so as as uh, the Millennials uh, start uh, controlling the, the rest of the world um, you'll start seeing uh, all of those th technologies being adopted in, in greater mass and and I, I think the, the future is really um, that combination of of what exists today, but are smarter today, more, more connected. Which, yeah, I, I mean, I could say Hyperloop, but uh, I don't know that, uh, that that's where we'll be um, by that time frame. But I think um, uh, in all the articles that I read in different types of technologies, there may be a, a time where there's so much transportation that you don't need to have a car anymore, that these services that are being provided by others um, and how we um, do your uh, multimodal type stuff um, could be there. So that I think that is, is one, uh, one thing it could be. Um, uh, but again, it's all the different technologies that make things more, um, more efficient more fuel efficient, more um, uh, uh, autonomous as we, as we talk about it. They can talk to different things, uh, talk to other vehicles, talk to red lights, talk to, uh, so get away from con congestion and, and those type of things. So I may be a little more pessimistic that we're going to see so much change in just 10 years. I do think there'll be a lot more safety technologies incorporated into vehicles, as Costa was mentioning. You know, things like automatic, uh, automated braking or lane keeping systems. So the cars that we're driving in 10 years will definitely be safer. But I do think we'll probably still be driving our own cars. I don't think shared vehicles are going to be so big in, in that reasonably short time frame. And one of the reasons I think that is because we've had car sharing for a while now. We had Zip Car, for example. And they really don't have all that many members. They may be 1.5 million out of 200 million drivers in the country. So it really hasn't caught on as a mass market thing. And I think a lot of the reason behind that is that 
the vast majority of us are still driving alone to work. And it's really hard to have a shared model where people are still trying to get to work during rush hour. So well, I think the technologies will improve. I think the fact that we'll still be, I think we'll still be driving, and I think mostly we'll still be in our own cars. I hope there'll be more investments to encourage walking and bicycling and transit use, but it's really hard to change that pattern of land use that leads a lot of people to drive alone most places. I agree with Lisa. I think it's, there's cause to be cautiously optimistic and kind of push for the future that we want. While we all want to be 10 years younger in the car world of 10 years is, is, is a blink of an eye. Uh, the major auto, uh, auto manufacturers would put the cars that you would buy in 10 years in motion five years from now. And so there's not a lot of time to really get the new car offerings that we would see in 10 years to be as advanced as we would want, as fast as we want. Now, that's not to say that hopefully you go into the car lot in 10 years and you see a lot more hybrid and electric models, way more uh, intelligence and connectedness, as Miguel was saying, incorporated either as standard or as, as low-cost options. And I do think that you'll see uh, millennials, as they come into, in, into their age, maybe some of them don't want to buy uh, their first car. Maybe they would uh, use some of these shared mobility services or use biking and, and, and walking as part of their mo normal mobility. But I do think uh, we have to be uh, optimistic but also realistic about where things are coming. I came here in a 19-year-old car. And so cars l stick around on the road for a long time. And the, the fleet of the future is going to look a lot like the fleet of today with a whole lot of exciting things entering, but still we have to wait for some stuff to leave. So I'll take the more optimistic view, but maybe not the most optimistic. The most optimistic view I've heard from some people says in 2027, it will be an entirely shared economy of entirely self-driving vehicles. And I think there are some very real realities that Costa was talking about here that says the average fleet age right now is over 10 years old. So just you go out on the road and you look at all the cars and go, ah, add it all up. The uh, People aren't going to throw away that economic investment. But I'll be a little more optimistic on this front at saying certainly from, from the Argo standpoint, if you've read the news, we have a product rollout scheduled, all right? It's publicly announced 2021 is there. So what will happen at that point? What can happen from 2021 to 2027? I think a couple of things are going on. Um, one, we're seeing uh, we're, we're seeing uh, uh, a massive surge in the sharing economy, uh, particularly in the in the form of companies like Uber, Lyft, uh, Didi in another country, uh, Via, uh, uh, Ford has Chariot, different scales of sharing that are going on. And one of the one of the challenges that a company like Zipcar's had in sharing is that how do you deal with the logistics of all the people are there, but we just dropped them all off. Now we've got to get rid of all the cars, except, well, but there's nobody to do it. Nobody's going the other direction. That's what the technology of self-driving cars uh, really allows you to be able to rethink. People are able to use the car when they are done with the car, and in a shared, uh, shared context, the car can go on and do something else. I mean, most cars are sitting idle over 90% of their lives, so there's a lot of time to take advantage of. Now, will it be the utopian future of everything? No. I don't, I think 2027 is way too soon to imagine all of that happening. But I think you will, I think in that, in that uh, Steelers victory, by the way, to be clear, uh, <laughs> I, I'd expect to see a significant amount of, of self-driving cars in that mix, expanding the options uh, that are available to people and how they choose to commute. So I'm going to ask a broader question before we get to the audience questions. This is about the culture of the car. We never, no one ever sat around and talked about the culture of the stagecoach or the structure of the, the culture of the railroad. And there were a couple songs about people's horses. Um, I don't mean the Mr. Red song. I mean uh, old paint and all of that. But um, the car has been a personal statement. What kind of car you drive? You use the car to listen to music. Um, you use the car to get your child to fall asleep. I'm sure I'm not the only parent who threw my kid into the car seat and drove around the block six times, hoping Elizabeth Shriven might someday go to sleep. <laughs> the car uh, provided an uh, introduction to sex. Let's not kid ourselves about that. <laughs> In my own community, uh, I grew up on the Massachusetts coast. You would you notice I said you rather than we. Um, one would drive to Marblehead Neck. Uh, and um, park right beside the lighthouse, and you would uh, watch the submarine races. Um, <laughs> Takes you a while to get that, but we all got it. 
And I have to say that automobile ads have sustained the business I've been in for more than four decades, and the contemplate, contemplating Bill Carter, a world without auto ads, is something that we, it's inconceivable. What, what was it about the car that became such a, an American statement? <laughs> I'm not going to get into the, you know, parking here <laughs> by the coast there, but um, I would say that, you know, the car, the car started becoming really popular in the U.S. about a century ago. The 19-teens and 20s were a huge explosion in car ownership, and we really started building our cities around that as our, you know, that was an era also of very high immigration, so we really started building around that. You know, the, the, the way we built in the 1800s was all around walking and horse transportation because you didn't have any other way to get to work. In the 1890s, we started building around streetcars, and suddenly you could you could spread out, but you still had to live near one of those stations. With the car, you could build cul-de-sacs and suburbs and have workplaces and homes really separated from each other. And we just there was a real anticipation: every family was going to have at least car, at least one car, maybe two. And it really, it, I think, it became part of our culture because we were really building around that that transportation technology. Um, in a way that other countries, you know, they were already much more built out at the time the car came along. In fact, Her Herbert Hoover's definition of prosperity was a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. And there's an aspect of freedom that's such an American attribute. We like to be able to make decisions on where we go, when we go, how we go, what we do, all along there. And so the car, my view, uh, you suddenly had this dramatically larger region that you could reach, you could tap into on your own terms. Now the neat part, speaking from self-driving side, is that we're actually going to be able to extend that opportunity now to people who haven't had the privilege, those who've lost the ability to drive safely, those who've never had that. And that's kind of a neat from self-driving view. But, the, but why did it get there in the first place? I don't know. That aspect of freedom and then controlling that degree of freedom to me seems to be this dominant attribute. We even had a television show called My Mother the Car. Right? Well, the, the car was the, the second most expensive thing that most people own, and so and outside of their home. And so that was a source of pride. It was a source of a, you know, a big chunk of their livelihood went to maintaining this car and washing it and fueling it and fixing it and being in the shop for, you know, that sounds terrible. It sounds, it sounds good to be uh, uh, self-driving and let somebody else take care of that. But the idea of, I think, Mobi freedom of mobility that wasn't tied to a, a train schedule is, is really what uh, is in the American ethos. And I do think that self-driving starts to get at that same thing. Yeah. Actually, if I can add one thing to that, I mean, the, the railroads here, the intercity railroads, they were a huge monopoly and they were, not, they were not popular businesses because they really control how much it would cost you to get between different cities. So when people had cars, there was a real rebellion, I think, against being so reliant on the railroads. Anybody else want to jump in? Sure. Uh, so I, I've spent uh, half of my life uh, in Europe and, and half here. So I can, I can give you my perspective. Uh, very old cities in Europe, you know, 1,000, 2,000 uh, years old, uh, very congested because they grew from uh, horse and carriage villages. That, uh, that just evolved with population. Here, a lot of uh, the cities are much newer, and they were built on designed grids uh, with uh, uh, smart thinking uh, on their side. The distances here are much greater uh, between uh, points than, uh, than, than, say, in Europe. So, um, but at the core of it is independence. It's the American independent uh, spirit, uh, the freedom, uh, like Pete was saying, to take off and go and get wherever you need to go, but you, because you also need to, to get there. You have those distances. Um, so uh, mass transportation in Europe became a necessity because you can't easily travel by car anywhere because it's the congestion. Um, so here, you, 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 uh, you don't have as much relatively. Uh, so you, you can get there, but, but so uh, cars are larger here. Um, they can travel uh, uh, longer distances in, in more comfort, and uh, uh, also because energy is much cheaper here. Um, when, when, when we have uh, in Europe eight dollars a gallon um, of, uh, of traditional fuels, and, and here it's uh, it's uh, less than 25 percent of that, so it gives you an idea that cheap energy enabled that uh, that uh, car independence. 
we we'll go to your, your questions, the audience questions, and we're we'll trying to dole them out to the most appropriate place. Well, already, I think I have about 175 questions here. Um, <laughs> ten seconds. Uh, ten seconds, Pete. Uh, how do we ensure that driverless technology increases equity and lowers energy consumption and doesn't dramatically increase the vehicle miles traveled? Great question. So the the question there gets a lot to societal questions and how we organizationally or kind of uh, nationally, whatever level we want to look at at those kind of interactions. The vehicles themselves have an individual purpose to do, and individual companies have a, a particular role. You know, Argo is a for-profit company. All the different companies in this are for-profit. Um, if the e economic incentives in a free market system that we can set up that are all policy-based, policy-driven, uh, we can influence that outcome. You know, uh, uh, Lisa was talking about the way we've designed cities to be very car-friendly and that hurt in other ways. So there's an opportunity here to kind of shape that. It's important from, from our standpoint, at least at Argo, to really look at this as kind of a community uh, adoption because we want the technology to be adopted, but if people don't want to use it, <laughs> I have a problem from my business standpoint standpoint and when the economic incentives are set up properly to support free market uh, processes to be at work but to have the policy structure in place I think that's the that's critical to actually making that work right. Costa, with all the new uh, smarter technologies should we worry about hackers or we used to say hackers were ca cabs or a company uh, acting as a big brother of some sort? So there's definitely going to be privacy and cybersecurity concerns with a transition to um, any connected infrastructure, and that's our cars, that's our electric grid, it's our toasters. Um, on the on the car side, though, we need to be building in uh, resiliency to attack rather than kind of shielding from an attack. So how do you isolate uh, something that? only has a, a, a limited amount of damage than, than making all cars stop at the entrance to the Squirrel Hill Tunnel at, the, at 5 o'clock. Um, they'll do that anyway, uh, but hopefully uh, we, can, we can stop kind of a, a system-wide outage. I think that this, it's realistic to understand that there are going to be some challenges. We need to continue to work on that. Um, but it, nothing's going to be hack-proof. Um, nothing is hack-proof. Um, I just wanted to add on, on this other comment, is that uh, our whole careers around transportation and, and analysis has been, transportation has done some really great things for, for human society and we want to continue and grow those things. But there's also been big challenges, you know, in, in the equity and environmental and safety concerns as we've been talking about. And it's already right now unsafe to drive while poor. Right? If you have an old car, uh, you're more at risk than you have a new car. And we have the opportunity with driverless uh, to expand the reach of um, transportation options to communities that have been underserved and ignored for a long, long time. And I think that we have an obligation ethically as engineers and analysts to kind of lay that all out now and vote uh, as, as humans before uh, the robots do the voting. But generally speaking, you don't think there's a, there's a threat that Putin could affect uh, President Trump's motorcade? <laughs> uh, I, can, I can neither confirm nor deny uh, any of that. That's what they all say these days. <laughs> self-driving, at least the self-driving and robotic capabilities of autonomous cars are great. But how are we to approach the social engineering aspects, such as people's needs to be in control and also their trust in technology? Well, you know, I, I don't think there's one big market for autonomous vehicles. I think there are a lot of sub-markets that vehicles serve. Um, when we talk about autonomous vehicles, you know, there's different levels of technology, and it's getting a little wonky, but we go from zero to five, right? Zero is a car that you, you know, drive now or drove 10 years ago where you do everything. And five is a car where you would never do anything. You can't steer, you can't brake, you can't put on the gas. The car is totally in control. I think there are some people and some companies that will find that very appealing. For example, you can imagine a trucking firm that is worried about their drivers, who aren't getting you know, the proper amount of sleep that they're supposed to have, and this is a way of controlling their fleet entirely. They might see that as a huge positive. There might be a lot of individuals who think that is a terrifying idea to be in a car where you don't know what's going to happen. So I don't think we can think of you know, one vehicle that's kind of serving everybody. Um, and I think there'll be some places where it's very accepted and some places where there's a lot of um, concern and people are dubious. Richard, with all the proposed uh, 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 automation, what will the future transportation infrastructure and workforce look like? 
Well, I, I, I believe really, I mean, you've got to realize the reason the United States um, is able to transportate transport goods is because of all the different interstates and different things we have. So I think you're going to start logistically wise, you're going to start seeing um, companies with better routes and where there's less fuel being used, more timely things. And when you can tie all that, uh, that different control into I think you're saving economically, environmentally, um, and, and again, I still think, I don't know that we'll ever get away from having somebody there at the wheel uh, at, at, at one time or there. I, I mean, I, I don't know that in my lifetime that, that that'll happen, but, uh, but again, you got to at least look to do that because, again, businesses are about, most of the businesses are about economics, so where you can save that, that your your uh, shareholders or your company money, um, and you can do it through uh, automation and and better um, logistics. I think that's the way to go. Well, Miguel, you being an expert in um, marine uh, transportation, this being a day like this, I'm tempted before I get to the uh, to the uh, question from our listener to ask you what Noah would have done on a day like this, <laughs> <laughs> and how he might behave in 2025. Uh, but nonetheless, people who drive uh, electronic cars think they're not polluting the environment, but electricity is made at power plants. What pollutes the environment more, coal-fired electric power plants or modern cars with gas engines and all the latest emissions, and I would add ships uh, that are co uh, constituted the way they are now? Yes. So. so um, uh, obviously, uh, the future, regardless of uh, to 2025 or 2035, uh, we all want a cleaner, um, cleaner uh, future. But to get to that cleaner future, we have to tackle two things. One, um, it has to be enabled by an energy that is affordable. And, uh, and two, the technologies have to be available to, to make that uh, same uh, vehicle, either it's a boat or a car, to move from point A to point B, to to do the same, but uh, have less less emissions. As you stated before, um, um, you know, to generate electricity, uh, we, we are dependent on uh, you know uh, natural gas, uh, producing electricity from from natural gas uh, turbines. Um, or, or, or nuclear, um, and so it's all the, about the cost of energy. So let me give you uh, this uh, insight into when I started Blue Gas Marine, we were uh, we were not necessarily looking at powering boats with natural gas. Our motto was, um, how are we going to uh, make boats more affordable to operate and have a substantial decrease in their emissions. So we looked at all available fuels, um, whether they were mainstream or not. We looked at propane, we looked at natural gas, at hydrogen, and what we determined uh, from uh, making prototypes to, to work on all of those was that from all of those, the only one that was either economically and cl um, uh, from a cleanliness perspective economically feasible for us to deploy and have a, a, a significant impact in both emissions and cost was natural gas. Uh, so that's why we, we went with it. Um, our system works on hydrogen too, but where, where will, will people fill up in the next uh, year, two years, three years? The, the, the hydrogen stations are incredibly uh, expensive. Um, so you have to, what I, what I said earlier, 2025 is a smarter, more connected future, but something that we already do now, just smarter, we're, we're living that motto. So th that's, where we're, uh, that's where we're headed. Um, it's, it's those two things, uh, technology enabling and uh, low cost of energy. O on, our, on our particular business, we think natural gas is the answer, not just a bridge fuel, but a very long bridge into something that uh, no other technologies exist and no other sources of energy can, uh, can provide uh, what we need for that cleanliness other than uh, natural gas. Maybe atomic batteries in 50 years, but we're not there yet. You know, uh, Peter, um, speaking of bridges, as we always do here in Pittsburgh, I noticed today that the Liberty Bridge will be closed from Friday at around 9 or 10 o'clock till, till Monday morning. 
How will the driverless cars know that? Well, two ways that they'll know that, uh, that I would expect to happen. One, if we actually have public announcements of scheduled closures, that's good information. That impacts what you do as a driver, and we expect self-driving cars to have mechanisms uh, also to kind of get the news out I to the fleet. I thought the answer was you'd read about it in the Post-Gazette. Uh, <laughs> well, digitally, of course. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll get that news feed there. Uh, the other part is you're going to discover all kinds of interesting events that have gone on that you weren't told about. And that's the typical day in the life of a driver, right? It's really boring to drive most of the time until there's something completely crazy, horrifying, scary, whatever. Uh, and self-driving cars need to, be, need to be prepared to handle that. So they'll have to see the world, make sense of the world that we do, and kind of react and respond. But in the meantime, cost a long-term and short-term. Can we get more people to use public transportation? And is that part of the solution here? I think it has to be part of the solution. Um, I think that driverless cars Fully driverless cars will help do that. Uh, we have a problem in, with the last mile, getting people from their homes to the bus station, to the bike station, to the train station. And if it's easy to get to that uh, east busway from someplace uh, by a one or two mile trip in a, in a driverless uh, one, of, one of Peter's cars, uh, you might see a lot more folks opting to take a real a quick trip in a driverless car to a longer, uh, you know, high density train trips. We, we won't be able to get the amount of people that come into the Golden Triangle every morning in, in single occupancy vehicles, whether they're driverless or not. So we have to be able to think about what moves at scale, what moves at density, and how do we enable that. I think driverless does a lot. So Lisa, you told us at the outset that you're an expert or examining uh, safety. So this is a good question for you. Okay. Inevitably, there are going to be some accidents and even some fatalities with autonomous cars. Is society equipped to deal with this, despite the overall safety improvements? Who will own the liability? The manufacturer? Who will pay the insurance? And if we're, if we're debating about the role of insurance companies in healthcare, what the hell are we going to say about the role of insurance companies? And I'm the son of an auto insurance dealer, uh, a salesperson. What are we going to do about the insurance companies uh, and with auto? Yeah, I mean, those are some really good questions, and I, I don't think there's, you know, kind of one definitive answer to how that's going to happen. Um, one issue that we have talked about is, I mean, the problem is that the insurance, insurance is regulated at the state level, whereas, you know, we would like going forward for autonomous vehicles to be regulated more at the federal level so that companies like Pete's don't have to develop different models of vehicles to travel in different states. So there is some idea that we might have to have some federal laws that preempt state laws about insurance, but I don't know how the auto manufacturers feel about assuming liability for their vehicles. And maybe there'll be some regime where, you know, we'll cover it for five years and you have to, maybe you have to um, get your car verified by some sort of third party that is still functioning properly. And maybe there has to be some sort of protocol for getting necessary software upgrades. But I mean, that's an issue that really, it's very important and it still needs to be worked out. So in short, we don't know. We don't know. Okay. Richard. <laughs> You won't know the answer to this one either, but okay. <laughs> how, how, receptive will, how receptive will departments of transportation around the country be to new cheaper fuels? Because they get tax money from gasoline. Well, uh, uh, Pennsylvania's prime. I mean, they're, they have the uh, DOT P3 project where they're moving uh, 29 of the 37 transit agencies over to natural gas. So they're already doing that, but uh, what DOT is doing right now is they're, uh, they're trying to figure out the tax uh, codes because they're going to be losing revenue from not selling, not selling petroleum-based fuels, so they've got to be able to, to have that, those dollars um, you know, replenished by the loss of the petroleum tax dollars. So that's, that's the biggest thing, but again, if, if you've got a cheaper fuel, uh, and you're able to do that, those savings should be able to be passed back on to the, to the consumers. And so in, in, in the long run, it should be cheaper uh, to operate that, that transit. I want to ask my own question on Marines. I grew up in a, in a marine, in a marine uh, community. Will people uh, have, will there be a sharing, uh, a sharing economy for boats? Will the people have Boston whalers that everybody can use? And, uh, what's the what's the recreational boat outlook for? Uh, uh, it already future? exists. Um, a, a lot of uh, a lot of folks that um, uh, use boats as as recreational uh, vehicles. Uh, there's some sort of 
feedback here, uh, <coughs> already have in certain locations the ability to uh, join a boat club where uh, just like um, uh, a country club, um, they pay a fee and then they can use any of the boats whenever they want without the, uh, without the hassle of having to clean them up uh, afterwards, which is, which is part of uh, the deterrent for, uh, for buying a boat. So, so there is already a shared economy and it's just getting more, more, more efficient. Um, the, uh, the other aspect of, uh, of, of sharing something is, uh, is also to make it more affordable. Um, and, uh, and that's what we bring in. Um, if, you, if you picture that operating a boat with, with our systems on board, um, if it's a gasoline operated boat, it, it's 70 to 80 percent cheaper to operate. Um, and boats consume a huge amount of fuel. Um, I'll, I'll give you the example. Um, most people that are not boaters don't, don't know how, how much uh, uh, fuel boats consume. So take an SUV, not the most efficient car, um, 200 uh, horsepower engine, weighs four or 5,000 pounds. Take this, a boat that weighs the same amount with an engine of the same power. Um, you, you're lucky if that SUV has got 20 miles per gallon fuel efficiency. Well, you're lucky if the best available engine on the boat will give you two miles per gallon. So uh, 10 times uh, uh, more fuel consumption on a very small boat. Now take a, take a, take a ferry that uh, does uh, 30, 40 trips a day, even just crossing the river. Now we're talking about thousands of gallons per, um, per, per day and, and per year. Now, uh, 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 for instance, a, a tugboat that uh, um, just brings uh, big ships in and out of port, less than five mile trips. You know, one of those 90 foot vessels um, has engines the size of locomotives and it, it uh, uh, burns a quarter million uh, gallons, so 250,000 gallons of diesel per year. Um, you know, the numbers are, are, are huge. So as part of that shared economy comes at bringing, bringing down the cost because you're using a, a cheaper and cleaner um, energy, but it's also the technology. So um, energy alone can reduce the cost of boating with our system by 50%. And then the other 20 to 30 percent comes from our technology, making it cleaner and burn more completely and take advantage of the higher octane uh, of, of natural gas, 130 octane for natural gas uh, versus the, uh, the, in the 90s for, or in the, in the 80s for, uh, for uh, traditional fuels. So that's, yeah. that's, that's my, uh, my so experience. So I would add that this would is known as, as the two happiest days in the life of a boat owner. <laughs> you all know this. The day you buy the boat and the day you sell it. Or upgrade to the bigger one because now you can afford it. Right. <laughs> so Pete, what needs to be done to allow Pittsburgh to continue to be in the forefront of self-driving? Well, uh, one thing that we, we need to be careful about is, is over-regulation. Uh, continuing the collaborative environment that Pittsburgh's always had is really important. Uh, we have policy uh, activities going on right here. Uh, we have development and re research and development activities. Uh, thoughtful, thoughtful ways of collaborating together are, are critical. The surest way to, uh, to kill things is start taking all of that out, blocking the progress that we could have. Uh, uh, that kind of inventive and creativeness and, and forward-looking mindset is really important too. It's like, okay, we are part of a, an ecosystem that is inventive and thoughtful and creative, and it means that there are going to be disruptions at times. And having an attitude of saying, well, let's try it, let's embrace it. The idea of the, the, the alternative vehicles that we just had downstairs uh, that many of you were able to, to see to go in and go out and have people like you who are curious about it. And let's find out about it, let's learn about it. Uh, people can get very scared of new technologies and disruption. Um, and, and can kind of push that off and say, I don't want that. You know, if, we, if we allow that to happen, uh, we won't be the, the center. So Costa, I think a lot of people have forgotten that when cars came in, people loved them in part because they were less polluting than horses. And you could imagine the kind of pollution that horses left behind on the street. What kind of uh, pollution and what kind of um, hazards will be produced, do you think, unanticipated hazards from driverless vehicles. Well, I want to add that 
Horses produce about 15 to 30 pounds of manure a day. And uh, in New York City and Brooklyn in the late, uh, 19, late 1800s, there was upwards of 200,000 horses. And so you would need you know, hundreds of today's garbage trucks just to get that manure out of the city. And there's actually the, the, the ironworks of Pittsburgh and, and other places made things that people would keep on their front doorstep to scrape off the manure from their boots. Right? So this used to be a huge deal. And when the automobile came along, it was a miracle cure to, for this problem because horses, the ho horse manure had disease and, and, uh, and smelled and it was terrible. Uh, then we found out that the, you know, the, there was lead, lead in the gasoline and there was climate change from, from the tailpipe. So there, there are always kind of unintended consequences as you move to a new technology. I think for driverless cars, you know, we need to make sure as much as we can that driverless cars uh, are el electrified as much as we can uh, and our grid is cleaned up uh, as fast as possible the, and these driverless cars are shared um, as, much, as, as much as possible. So the, we, we have a sustainable mobility future ahead of us with electrified, shared, and driverless vehicles. It's just we need the, the business and the policy environment to help that take place. Lisa, do you think coal will be part of the future at all? Coal? Coal. You remember coal. I do remember coal. <laughs> I was just hoping that question would go to someone else. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, China is the world's leading producer of greenhouse gases, and they don't seem to be moving away as quickly as they have promised from coal. So, I mean, certainly I think in other countries, you know, to the extent that it remains inexpensive, it's really hard to you know, introduce new and cleaner technologies and fuels unless, as Miguel said, you know, they have to be cost effective as well. So Richard, uh, what will happen to all these truck drivers, for example, uh, who, who take our goods from coast to coast, uh, who, who deliver the Post-Gazette? Uh, will they be replaced by robotics? Is there a, another place in the transportation infrastructure where they might find work? Well, I, again, um, we're sitting here uh, you know, on, on I guess the the ga natural gas of, of Saudi Arabia oil uh, here, and I, I think you know we're already putting a lot of people to work in the in the gas industry. Um, we're we're starting to ship some of that that gas overseas, and it's good for our our economy. Um, you know, I think we need to be diverse in what we do. Um, you know, I'm sorry, I I, I come from where my mom used to get the coal and that's when that fell off the fell off the train to, to heat their homes back when they were they were young. But I, I, I think that coal's still gonna be around. I think all the, the solar, the wind, uh, the nuclear and everything we have going on, I think it's the diversity that's gonna make this country energy um, uh, we have our own diverse energy and so um, I think that, that looks great to our future to do that. Miguel, what, what are the steps for a cultural change in Pittsburgh to transform us from single person in a car or in a boat even to a multi-system multi that includes not only driverless cars but light rail and other kinds of things? Cultural changes. Yeah, so um, I, 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 uh, I don't know uh, the, the answer for that. Uh, um, I, I'm much better at answering questions about technology and uh, economics. If you but, do the call, uh, yeah. I'll do that one. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll just walk. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the main reasons that people drive so much in this country is, it's two words, it's free parking. 90, over 90% 90 of people who drive alone to work are able to park for free at their workplace. And that is a huge incentive for people to drive by themselves because there's, there's no there's no reason to pick someone else, you know, on your way up. Pick someone else up on your way to work. We've tried for a long time to encourage carpooling in all different metros around the country. It really hasn't caught on. Uh, that said, it is awfully hard to be the person running for city council on a platform where we need to make parking scarce and more expensive. <laughs> so, to to, uh, to to help her out on the on the coal question, um, there is a, there is a dynamic. Um, that uh, coal has with uh, with its uh, um, the other form of energy that uh, can replace it uh, uh, energy wise, which is natural gas. Um, if if um, if coal gets too expensive, natural gas will will replace it. There is no economic incentive to to use coal. Um, just economically speaking, if natural gas is too expensive, then coal will replace it. 
And so there's that dynamic. Neither can get too expensive because uh, then, then uh, the other one, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, cannibalizes uh, that, that business. So, so that interest, uh, interesting dynamic uh, currently exists. And, uh, uh, you know, in, in China, um, where they have no practical solutions to create massive amounts of energy, they need both. And so that's why they still have a lot of coal plants. And coal plants are closing here because it's, you know, natural gas is a domestic uh, energy and it's, it's, it's cheap and clean and abundant. So it's replacing, it's replacing them. Um, and uh, over there where they import a lot of coal and also natural gas, um, well, you know, it's, it's just economics and creating that energy. Interestingly enough, China has the largest natural gas reserves of natural gas on Earth, but they don't have the technology to extract it. Um, so uh, that's the dynamic with coal and natural gas. So Peter, what will be the uh, big turning point when people actually start sharing vehicles more? Well, partly right now, it are, it's, it's happening in certain segments right now. Uh, you know, we talk to people who live in downtown San Francisco. Uh, a number of them have given up their cars because it's just, it's expensive to own, it's expensive to operate, it's expensive to park, you're in congestion all the time. Uh, it's kind of these, these practical life factors mixed together. And you go, you know, then there's the other services, the shared mobility services with human drivers right now. Uh, and you go, you know, that's just, it just makes more sense. The, uh, the kind of the spirit of the free market system and the economic drivers that are there, uh, I think really are our dominant factors here, much more so than I, uh, if you wind the clock back, here's a good test. We, uh, we often try to predict forward 10 years, look back 10 years and, and think about it, like Uber did not exist 10 years ago and yet it's the world's largest uh, you know, startup, right? $69 billion valuation. Uh, they're doing millions of rides all over the place. Lyft just crossed the million rides a day threshold. These are, these are shared mobility in a way of people not owning a car, or at least at then that phase, not using a car that they own. Uh, but we're seeing this migration as people go, wow, it becomes a reliable enough service, it's low enough cost, I could actually give it up. And it, reliability is hugely important. And, and, uh, I don't just mean the car breaks down or not. I mean it's there when I need it, this aspect of freedom. Uh, you talked about, uh, about the last mile problem. Uh, why would I not use public transportation? <laughs> because I can't get from here to there unless I get in my car anyway and do that. So when you start to bring these factors together and say it's, it's low enough cost, um, it's shared and I'm incentivized, and it's like Uber Pool or Lyft Line or things like that, where I'm incentivized to, to, uh, to use the shared service because I actually get a price break. People go, ah, you know, Uber X rather than the original Uber service, which was more of a black car limousine luxury experience. You know, Uber X is you get into somebody's car and they're driving, you know, part time on their own. It's not the most luxurious experience, but I save a nice penny. And suddenly you get people to decide, do I want that personal luxury experience? You give them options and choices. And at times they might say yes. And at times they might say, you know, a big shared bus, I'll be quite happy to deal with that. And having that range of options. I think the key is to make them, uh, uh, to make them cost effective, to make them accessible. Uh, I believe self-driving is, is solves one of these logistical challenges of, of the gap when there is no one to get it to the other side. I think that's part of it. But I, I really think it's really driven by a lot of these other factors uh, that come into play. Costa, why are we talking so much about cars anyhow? How come we don't talk about trains? Oh, I love trains. Trains are great. Yeah. Um, I, it's, I think what Peter was saying is that um, even in the shared mobility space right now, it's most effective in a dense urban area. And trains are most effective when you have the you know, ridership uh, to support these types of uh, you know, origins and destinations with, with mass transit. I do think that driverless allows the synergy. And there are companies right now that um, you, the, you can program that they'll know when you're getting off your train or getting off your bus and they'll have a, a driver Lyft or Uber waiting there for you to take you that last mile home. And I think that those types of solutions that make it easy for people to you know, get into mass transit is, is the, the first step towards uh, a lot more people using them. So Lisa, when all this technology transforms our cities, will rural America be left even further behind? That's a really good question. Uh, when cars first started to be 
you know, introduced in this country, I mean, the rural areas were the first people to adopt them because if you lived in a city, you already had access to a streetcar or you could walk most places. Um, and now it's a bit reversed in that, you know, um, most people in rural areas, uh, rural areas tend to be lower income. People have older and less reliable cars. They're paying more in gas taxes. Um, I think it is very hard to make a shared model work in rural areas because you simply don't have the population density that Pete and Costa were talking about. Um, that said, um, certainly from a safety perspective, about half of our crashes, or our fatalities take place in urban areas, my urban I mean urban and suburban, and half take place in rural areas, but only 20% of our population is rural. So that means you're at much higher risk of being, in a, being killed in a car crash in a rural area. So I think to the extent that we're bringing new safety technologies into rural areas, I think that could be a huge boon for them. Richard, novel technology tends to be expensive and available to those with more resources. This is kind of an adjunct to Lisa's question. How do we plan to address potential injustice in access to new technologies? Well, I think um, there are grants and, and foundations and things like that and people that are, um, that are looking to help promote that. I, I, again, when we're uh, just like event we're having today and, and how many people haven't seen all these different technologies that are out there and they had the ability to come down and, and talk with people who actually drive them, use them, um, that. But as, as you're, as the more people that, that uh, uh, use that technology, it's like everything else that will eventually come down. I think if they could make every one of the technologies that we have today within a thousand or two thousand dollars of a regular petroleum based thing, we probably, a lot of us would be driving them right now. So I think that's, that's uh, uh, the government does spend a lot of money on research as well as individual companies in trying to reduce uh, uh, that for the general public. So, Miguel, I know this is a stretch, but you're the water guy. And uh, one of our, again, this is a stretch. One of our uh, guests asked this question, hydroelectricity. Is that still around? Is that what? Is that still a big factor? Um, well, obviously, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the cleanest ways to generate electricity, right? Uh, through uh, uh, water moving. Um, Here's, here's uh, you know, I, I believe that uh, there's a, th there ought to be a mix, uh, energy mix in, in, in the future. And I mean, um, it, it all goes uh, about what Pete said uh, earlier. It's uh, diversification and, and, and giving people choices. So um, what can we do today um, with, uh, with hydroelectrical? Um, and uh, electricity, for instance, on and, and around boats, uh, both for propulsion and, and pollution. So we believe that boats 16 feet and smaller, so mainly recreational boats, there are electrical engines and there are uh, uh, some batteries that if you don't want to go very far, you can, you can use without running uh, very quickly, you know, one or two hours worth of use. So, yes, there, there, there is, uh, you know, there's an electric component to marine. Unfortunately, because of the amounts of energy for, for, for larger uh, vessels moving on water, we need uh, uh, energy that is more dense. Uh, uh, all we have today is the traditional fuel, so uh, natural gas is, is a good replacement for that. But uh, also, uh, let's talk about uh, from a pollution point of view um, and, and, and water. Um, uncombusted traditional fuel on boats ends up in, in two, two locations, air and in, in the water. Uh, unburned fuel, it's that sheen that you see on, on the water. So. When we put one of our systems on it, we, um, we almost um, eradicate water pollution. Uh, natural gas is very clean and does not mix with water. So, um, <clears throat> and it burns almost completely. So uh, <clears throat> we, we eliminate water pollution by almost uh, 100%. Um, so you want that clean, clean water, uh, not just because uh, you're drinking it, but, uh, but also um, so the animals in it um, and uh, and plants can uh, can uh, can can do better. You know, 60 to 70 percent of people that go on a boat, they go on a boat for fishing. So there's there's a, there's a love of, of nature right there. Um, we're we're trying to foster foster that, but 
by all means, uh, hydroelectrical still has a, a place. Pete, uh, what company will be the first one to develop the driverless car and, and to market it well? Uh -huh. uh, and to market it well. Can I add a few more qualifiers? Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so we actually, we need to get back to the levels of autonomy question, partly to, to clarify that answer. So you already see things that are at kind of the level two driver assist functionality. Many automakers uh, are doing that. Tier one suppliers are providing those technologies. Auto industries are, you know, whether it's from the OEMs themselves or the tier ones. Lots of lots of those are out there. So that's a past tense, and I don't remember who made it first. But um, uh, as we move up to level four, where we're talking about a system where you can fall asleep at the wheel, that's the horse race that's going on. And well, all right, you know, you're uh, right now. It's very difficult for anyone to really know with any certainty where everyone is, let alone when they're going to get across the line. Uh, our answer uh, from an Argo perspective is 2021. We're going to get there. Will others beat us to it? We'll we'll find out. Scale is important question, though. For a lot of the kinds of questions that have been coming up here as we're thinking about this, uh, and actually one of the reasons why Brian and I decided to partner with Ford uh, directly right now, uh, very early in our company's life, uh, is that we want to be able to actually go beyond the technology demonstration. You know, I've spent a lot of years of my life doing technology demonstrators at the university, first as a grad student, then 15 years in a, in a faculty role there, doing all kinds of demonstrations to prove to companies that the technology was mature enough to at least assess in their marketplace. And I made this leap because I believe this particular product space of self-driving cars is actually ready for deployment. We're ready to do that. Um, but to have the kind of impact that we're talking about and to take your 10-year speculation, if you put 10 cars or 50 cars or even 1,000 cars out into the world, 1,000 cars realize that a company like Ford Motor Company produces 6 million cars every single year. So 1,000 cars or even 10,000 cars, is, it's, it's not noticeable, it's not measurable on, on the, uh, the scale of worldwide production of all automobiles. So for our standpoint, to really do this at scale, that's the big game, that's the game changer. Uh, it's hugely important to do the technology development steps. That's why I've devoted so many years of my life to doing that. But, when, but we really won't see a, a, a societal transformation until there are enough vehicles out there to really make a difference. So I want to ask my own follow-up follow sure. here. In the 1920s, the secretary, uh, member of the, of the uh, Coolidge um, cabinet said, what's good for General Motors is good for America. <laughs> Let's turn it around. What's good for America, can that be good or bad for General Motors and Ford? Is this a good thing for GM and Ford? Well, certain, both of those companies, and certainly Ford, I'm obviously working very right. closely with them now, uh, uh, you know, Bill Ford has been speaking very publicly even before, the, before all of the autonomous vehicle announcements and everything else, for many, many years, talking very publicly about a revolution in mobility. Uh, that's been coming. There's a neat TED talk that he's given on the topic, um, probably eight years ago at this point, uh, and and he's positioning Ford, you know, with his whole leadership team, um, and through a series of by this point, you know, multiple leadership teams over that kind of time period. Um, really a consistent theme throughout it is to make sure that Ford, Ford talks about the next century. <laughs> you know, not a whole lot of companies out there uh, in, our, in my wonderful high-tech world uh, that we, we count years, that's neat. Decades is unbelievable. You know, Ford's out there with over a century of experience. GM, so they're long things. They're trying to position themselves to be part of that. So is it a good thing? They will definitely want it to be a good thing. And uh, certainly the Ford investment in Argo, uh, we see as a huge, a huge uh, commitment on their part to be part of that revolution. Can I follow up to that, Dave? I was going to ask you to do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I agree, um, and I, it's about maximizing the benefits and min minimizing some of the downsides. Uh, we build our cars right now out of steel and aluminum, plastic, and glass because it's it's protect you when you get into a crash. But w in a world of fully driverless, and it's going to take a long time where the whole fleet is fully driverless. But let's imagine that we're in that world. And there's no crashes. Do you need uh, 3,000 pounds or 4,000 pounds of steel sitting, uh, sitting around you? No. You could have a carbon fiber shell. You could have even an inflatable shell. And so who makes bumpers when there are no accidents? Who makes quarter panels and uh, windshields and tailpipes and mufflers when everything's electrified? Right. So an entire disruption of the first and second tier uh, automaker supplier market would eventually result, uh, not today, not tomorrow, but eventually result from this type of shift. 
And we can see that coming, and we should be able to take steps and policy-wise uh, to help the, those communities and those, uh, those workers transition to what's next. What, who was addressing ethical questions, Lisa, involving choices between injury to, pedest to pedestrians versus passengers? With regard to autonomous vehicles yeah. or just in general? Um, I would like to ask when the autonomous vehicle persons do. <laughs> there's been a lot of interest in that, um, but I mean, there's a lot around machine learning, but I think someone ultimately has to be doing some programming to think about you know, does a car save me or does it, does it save the pedestrian? So we're just talking here about not, not needing windshields and not needing mm -hmm. uh, bumpers. Are pedestrians at risk? Uh, you know, I think it's certainly possible. I mean, it's hard for me to envision a future in which there are totally zero crashes. I mean, the thing I alluded to earlier about road to zero, the idea is there is to try to eliminate serious crashes. And serious crashes tend to be the ones that take place at higher speeds. If you're a pedestrian and you're hit by a car going 20 miles an hour, you're probably gonna live. If you're hit by a car going 30 miles an hour, you're probably not gonna make it. So the idea of transforming our transportation system where we might still have a lot of minor crashes, a lot of fender benders, but not ones that are so serious as to kill people, I mean, I think that would be really, that's beneficial for both drivers as well as pedestrians. Is this crowd here, which constitutes basically Pittsburgh's jaywalkers, are they in danger? <laughs> I mean, I certainly hope not, but right now people are at danger. About 10 or 15 percent of people killed by cars every year are pedestrians or bicyclists. They're not people in the vehicle at all. So we're not doing a great job now protecting uh, pedestrians and bicyclists. Within a lot of cities that have adopted this movement, this uh, goes by visions here in a lot of cities, the idea is to slow down the traffic, and both by um, having a lower speed limit as well as building the infrastructure such that people really can't drive too quickly. For example, you build an intersection so that you really have to slow down to make that right-hand turn, and you're not taking it at 25 miles an hour. So I think there are a lot of things we can do uh, that, are, that are just around the infrastructure that would be helpful for pedestrians. And as a very frequent pedestrian myself, I absolutely applaud that. Hold it. Everyone was in love with, with uh, driverless cars until you mentioned that they're going to be slower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say driverless cars would be slower. I did say that in urban areas, we would definitely want to see lower speeds, which would reduce crashes. It would reduce, excuse me, reduce fatalities and serious injuries. More evidence that you are not running for office. That, that is very true. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, do you see a possibility of a mass restructuring of traffic patterns and infrastructure as a result of this? I, I, I don't know about traffic patterns, but I think um, uh, the autonomous with red lights and, and different things like that to keep less idling. Uh, then again, if we move to the electric vehicle, then you're not having uh, idling. But I think to be able to keep traffic flow, I think that's what Pittsburgh, uh, um, the Port Authority is trying to do with their rapid transit uh, that they're trying to do. In other words, being able to keep traffic moving and less traffic. So now whether or not they're um, whether they're trying to uh, change the traffic patterns. I don't know, you're seeing a lot more of the, uh, the roundabouts now um, and a lot of the new things in the state where if you've been in upstate New York, it's almost every one of the exits off of uh, some of the interstates up there all have those roundabouts and that's to slow people down exactly. and keep traffic moving without standing there trying to cut out in front of everybody, so. Okay, Miguel. You talked about the horrifying MPG, miles per gallon, mm -hmm. of boats. Mm -hmm. But the poor MPG is the dirty little secret of recreational vehicles. Is anyone, to your knowledge, translating the increased efficiency of fleet vehicles to the RV market? Uh, can, you, can, you, uh, can you repeat the question again? Okay, sure. So, <laughs> recreational vehicles, yeah. they have a, t a horrifying MPG, yeah. right? You mentioned changes in the MPG in boats. Is anyone trying to, to adapt um, the, uh, um, th these, lar these large RVs in the same kind of technology you're talking about? Right. Um, unfortunately, I don't think so um, for, for the, our, our RVers. Um, once again, it goes back to um, a, an economics uh, point of view. So think about this. What has made um, natural gas cars successful um, in, in the United States. Um, 
It's the fleets, um, because they exhibit fleet behavior. Um, they, they depart from a location, they return to the same location in the same day uh, or at the end of their route, and they can fill up on natural gas there. So it's easy to, to put an infrastructure together um, uh, on, on fleet vehicles. Um, in, uh, in personal vehicles and recreational vehicles, there's just not enough uh, fuel consumption to warrant having to put these stations all over the place. Um, in uh, in uh, boats, um, you know, an RV can have a, 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 an efficiency of six miles per gallon, so three times better than a boat. Um, uh, how, however, um, the uh, it's not used often enough. So the amounts of, of fuel used in, uh, in RVs are, are, uh, are not enough to warrant the cost of, say, for instance, a natural gas system for, um, for, for an RV. Now, um, as, as tank, uh, natural gas tank technologies evolved, and they're not made of carbon fiber, or what we call encrusted diamonds, because they're so expensive, uh, uh, th th that may change that dynamic. Um, however, it is the amount of fuel that you spend that makes you know, a, a five or $6,000 upgrade feasible. So we six are gonna go to dinner after this panel. How would we get to dinner five years from now, and how would we get to dinner 10 years from now, anybody? Isn't it three blocks and we should yeah, walk? walk. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope that doesn't change. That's a good wise guy answer. <laughs> but it's about three quarters of a mile. I'll say from out. my perspective, um, six months to a year from now, we'll, uh, we'll go by boat because uh, Washington Landing Marina will have, uh, will have a, a natural gas station, and the first boats uh, operating on natural gas will be right here in Pittsburgh, and you, you can enjoy odorless boating while you're uh, over there uh, going to the, uh, to the Steelers uh, game. Well, the Post Gazette sign, will... Sign me up. <laughs> the Post Gazette will save a lot of money because some of our guests will be seasick on the way to dinner. <laughs> Anybody else? I just want to tell you all that actually I invented Uber, uh, it happened about 10 years ago. I had two daughters uh, who had to go out, well, didn't have to go out, they wanted to go out on New Year's Eve. And they asked their teetotaling dad to pick them up. And on the way home, I proposed that we create a company called www.soberdad.com. <laughs> so one of the reasons I'm sitting here in the piddly little newspaper business and not an Uber entrepreneur is that we never did anything with that. But anyhow, as SoberDad.com, I want to thank all of you for uh, your remarkable contributions here, to thank all of you for having told us by attending here on an evening like this, uh, so many of you, really remarkable, how important this issue is to all of you. To thank the Post-Gazette, Lisa Herm, who is our uh, general manager, Tracy D'Angelo, who is the head of all things marketing and all good things at the Post-Gazette, to thank Bill Carter, of course, who, uh, who sells our ads, and um, Bill Southern, who is our uh, uh, financial guy, and so many people from the marketing department, but mostly to thank all of you. We'll see you again very soon. I'm gonna look up the date, September 13, when we're gonna talk about empowering the economy with innovation. I suspect many of these topics will be, uh, will be uh, recur. And on November 1st, energy's impact on culture and the future. So I look forward to seeing all of you uh, on the 13th of September and the 1st of November. And I hate to say this, gentlemen, but drive carefully. <laughs>